please welcome the 14th Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden. Thank you. Hello. And welcome. I'm delighted to see all of you here with us tonight for our new Poet Laureate's opening reading. You may clap right now. As the Librarian of Congress, I'm charged with appointing the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, poetry every year a position that by law is described as equivalent to that of Poet Laureate of the United States. What an awesome responsibility. The library surveyed over 120 poetry experts from coast to coast, editors and critics, publishers, bookstore owners, and of course, our former Poet Laureates. And in the end, the choice was crystal clear. But before I sing the praises of our new appointee, I want to introduce a very special guest. This year, for the first time ever, our nation has its own National Youth Poet Laureate. Now this position was almost a decade in the making. In 2008, the literary organization Urban Word worked with the New York City with New York City to launch their Youth Poet Laureate program. And since then, 41 other cities across the country, from Seattle to South Florida, Boston to Los Angeles, Madison to Baton Rouge, followed suit. And this past year, Urban Word identified its first group of regional national Youth Poet Laureate finalists in the Northeast, Southeast, South, Midwest, and West. And in April, they named the first ever National Youth Poet Laureate. Now, Urban Word didn't do it all alone. There were plenty of organizations to thank for this nationwide effort. And please join me in recognizing a few of Urban Word's wonderful local partners. Do More Baltimore, the host for Baltimore's Youth Poet Laureate. Dialect USA, the host for Prince George's <laughs> County's Youth Poet Laureate. And Words, Beats, and Life, the host for the Washington, D.C. Youth Poet Laureate. <laughs> and finally, thank you to Michael Corelli, Executive Director of Urban Word. Michael, could you please stand up? There he is. Your vision and hard work has paid off tenfold, and the Library of Congress is delighted to do its part in promoting the National Youth Poet Laureate. And what an inspiring young woman you found to take on that role. In her 19 years, LA native Amanda Gorman has done more to speak out, organize, and give back than most of us do in a lifetime. I had the pleasure of riding the elevator today with her grandmother. Can you please stand up? Now you can read about Amanda's many accomplishments in your program or talk to her grandmother. <laughs> and tonight we have the privilege to hear Amanda read a poem she's composed especially for this occasion. So please join me in welcoming Amanda Gorman, the nation's first Youth Poet Laureate. <laughs> Center yourself. <laughs> Get ready. 
Um, before I read my poem, I wanted to give my most sincere thank you to the Library of Congress and Chasey K. Smith for involving me in such a phenomenal occasion. So round of applause to this program, please. My poem is called, In This Place, An American Lyric. There's a poem in this place, in the footfalls, in the halls, in the quiet beats of the seats. It is here at the curtain of day where America writes a lyric you must whisper to say. There's a poem in this place, in the heavy grace, the lined face of this noble building, collections burned and reborn twice. There's a poem in Boston's Copley Square, where protest chants tear through the air like sheets of rain, where love of the many swallowed hatred of the few. There's a poem in Charlottesville, where tiki torch a string, a ring of flame, tight round the wrist of night, where men so white they gleam blue, seem like statues, where men heap that long wax burning ever higher, where heather higher blooms forever in a meadow of resistance. There's a poem in the great sleeping giant of Lake Michigan, defiantly raising its big blue head to Milwaukee and Chicago. A poem begun long ago, blazed into frozen soil, strutting upward and aglow. There's a poem in Florida, in East Texas, where streets swell into a nexus of rivers, cows afloat like mottled boys in the brown, where courage is now so common that 23-year-old Jesus Contreras rescues people from floodwaters. There's a poem in Los Angeles, yawning wide as the Pacific tide, where a single mother swelters in a windowless classroom, teaching black and brown students in Watts to spell out their thoughts so her daughter might write this poem for you. There's a lyric in California where thousands of students march for blocks, undocumented and unafraid, where my friend Rosa finds the power to bloom in deadlock her spirit the bedrock of her community. She knows hope is like a stubborn ship gripping a dock, a truth that you can't stop a dreamer or knock down a dream. How could this not be her nation, su nation, our country, our America, our American lyric to write to, a poem by the people, the poor, the Protestant, the Muslim, the Jew, the native, the immigrant, the black, the brown, the blind, the brave, the undocumented and undeterred, the woman, the man, the non-binary, the white, the trans, the ally, to all of the above and more. Tyrants fear the poet. Now that we know it, we can't blow it. We owe it to show it, not slow it. Although it hurts to sow it when the world skirts below it. Hope, we must bestow it like a wick in the poet so it can grow lit, bringing with it stories to rewrite. The story of a Texas city depleted but not defeated, a history written that need not be repeated, a nation composed but not completed. There's a poem in this place, a poem in America, a poet in every American who rewrites this nation, who tells a story worthy of being told on this minnow of an earth to breathe hope into a palimpsest of time, a poet and every American who sees that our poem penned doesn't mean our poems end. There's a place where this poem dwells. It is here, it is now, in the yellow song of dawn's bell, where we write an American lyric we are just beginning to tell.
Well, thank you, Amanda, for your wonderful poem and for setting the stage for our poet laureate, Tracy K. Smith. If Amanda represents where poetry can go, Tracy has brought us here and there in poem after poem and book after book. During the selection process, I had the opportunity to sit down at home and read Tracy's Pulitzer Prize winning poetry collection, Life on Mars, and I was wowed. In poems such as My God, It's Full of Stars, The Speed of Belief, and yes, Life on Mars, Tracy takes us farther than we imagine we can go, to the great beyond and deeply inward as well. Her poems walk us through their wandering. Their power is that they can go anywhere they want, scientific fact, pop artifacts, bits of memories, and arguments of faith. They aren't simple, but they are direct. And they aren't afraid to face the painful parts of our past and present. My favorite moment in the book came in the poem, they may love all that he has chosen and hate all that he has rejected. While the title dates back more than 2,000 years to the Dead Sea Scrolls, the poem moves straight to the present day horror of hate crimes making news. Tracy shows us in a new and yet intuitive way how hatred changes us. Instead of just reading about hatred, she asks us to imagine it, to feel it, to own it in a way that can't be easily ignored. The great American poet William Carlos Williams wrote, it is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. Our great American poet and newest poet laureate knows how to give us the news our minds and hearts and souls most need. Please join me in welcoming Tracy K. Smith. Thank you, Dr. Hayden, and thank you, Amanda. I feel so much joy um, and hope and belief when I hear your voice, Amanda. I know the future is in good hands and that poetry will remain alive and well, so thank you. Um, and Dr. Hayden, it's such a, an honor to be um, selected and introduced by you. Um, I remember when I was very young, I started but was never able to finish a poem in which I was trying to imagine the afterlife as a library. <laughs> and I think I was on to something because moving through the, these mammoth buildings, through the hallways, the beautiful halls, and then the underside of the building, all the tunnels, I realized there's something magnificent and divine that's housed here, but there's also something um, ethereal that is born of, of the energy and the belief that, that builds places like this. So I'm extremely grateful to be here tonight, I'm excited about the year ahead um, and the conversations that, that uh, poetry will allow me to have with my fellow Americans. So I thought I would go back to the beginning and read a few poems from each of my books and, and finish with some newer work that, that makes up um, my forthcoming book, Wade in the Water. So these are poems from The Body's Question. A hunger so honed. Driving home late through town, he woke me for a deer in the road, the light smudge of it fragile in the distance, free in a way that made me ashamed for our flesh. His hand on my hand, even the weight of our voices not speaking. I watched a long time, and a long time after we were too far to see, told myself I still saw it, nosing the shrubs, all phantom and shadow. So silent, it must have seemed I hadn't wakened 
but passed into a deeper, more cogent state. The mind, a dark city, a disappearing, a handkerchief swallowed by a fist. I thought of the animal's mouth and the hunger entrusted it, a hunger so honed the green leaves merely maintain it. We want so much when perhaps we live best in the spaces between loves, that unconscious roving, the heart its own rough animal, unfettered. The second time, there were two that faced us a moment the way deer will in their Greek perfection, as though we were just some offering the night had delivered. They disappeared between two houses, and we drove on, our own limbs, our need for one another, greedy, weak. Thank you. You're gonna get tired if I make you clap after each poem, so don't worry. <laughs> um, so a large portion of my first book is, is dedicated to the memory of my mother who died when I was 22. And so I'm gonna read just a couple of sections from what I think of as the heartbeat of this book, which is an elegy to her called Joy. Imagining yourself a girl again, you ask me to prepare a simple meal of dumplings and kale. The body is memory. You are nine years old playing hospital with your sisters. These will be my medicine, you tell them, taking a handful of the raisins that you love. They've made the room dark and covered you with a quilt, though this is the South in summer. The body is appetite. You savor the kale, trusting this one need. But the body is cautious does not want more than it wants. Soon, there will be a traffic of transparent tubes striking their compromise with the body. When you close your eyes, I know you are listening to a dark chamber around a cord of light. I know you are deciding that the body's a question. What do you believe in? It will rain tomorrow, as it rained in the dark days after you died. And I will struggle with what to wear and take a place on the bus among those I will only ever know by the shape their shoulders make above the backs of the seats before mine. It's November, and storm clouds ascend above the roofs outside my window. I don't know any more where you've gone to, whether your soul waits here, in my room, in the kitchen with a newly blown bulb, or whether it rose instantly to the kingdom of Hosanna's. Some nights, walking up my steps in the dark, digging for the mail and my keys, I know you are far, infinitely far from us that you watch in the way one of us might pause a moment to watch a frenzy of ants, wanting to help to pick up the crumb and put it down close to their hill, seeing their purpose that clearly. These are some poems from uh, Duende. Many of you will recognize that term as um, one that uh, Garcia Lorca kind of brought into the wider uh, vocabulary of, of art. Um, it's used to describe the wild, oftentimes dark and unpredictable energy that we all house, not just artists, but people, um, and that a daring artist might seek to um, draw out and wrestle with in art making. I loved that so much when I was a student reading uh, about it in workshop and saying, oh, I wanna have that kind of passionate sense of my work. And then years later, um, traveling, I realized this sense of wrestling with something that might undo you and 
surviving the effort with something remarkable to show, something that's not just beautiful, but something that's um, raw and damaged and profound. That's not just something artists do. Um, I, I think about the way that people all over the world, um, all over our world, um, are wrestling with something that seeks to undo them and they do their best and, and oftentimes they overcome it. And so this concept became something that had to do with just the urgency of being human. Um, so I'll read you a, a couple of poems from that book that's thinking with it. The first one is set in Spain um, where the speaker of the poem is observing the um, art form, the traditional art form of the deep song that um, Lorca worked so hard to translate to readers. Um, outside of Spain. This poem is called Duende. The earth is dry, and they live wanting, each with a small reservoir of furious music heavy in the throat. They drag it out, and with nails in their feet, coax the night into being, brief believing, a skirt shimmering with sequins and lies. And in this night that is not night, each word is a wish, each phrase a shape their bodies ache to fill. I'm going to braid my hair, braid many colors into my hair. I'll put a long braid in my hair and write your name there. They defy gravity to feel tugged back, the clatter, the mad slap of landing. And not just them, not just the ramshackle family, the tios primitos, not just the bailaor whose heels have notched and hammered time so the hours flow in place like a tin river marking only what once was. Not just the voices scraping against the river, nor the hands nudging them farther, fingers like blind birds, palms empty, echoing, not just the women with sober faces and flowers in their hair, the ones who dance as though they're burying memory one last time beneath them. And I hate to do it here, to set myself heavily beside them, not now that they've proven the body a myth, parable not even for what not even language moves quickly enough to name. If I call it pain and try to touch it with my hands, my own life, it lies still and the music thins, a pulse felt for through garments. If I lean into the desire it starts from, if I lean unbuttoned into the blow of loss after loss, love tossed into the ecstatic void, it carries me with it farther to cords that stretch and bend like light through colored glass. But it races on toward shadows where the world I know and the world I fear threaten to meet. There is always a road, the sea, dark hair, dolor, always a question bigger than itself. They say you're leaving Monday. Why can't you leave on Tuesday? Okay. And this poem um, is one that I kind of think of as, as an example of like the domestic duende. It's called Slow Burn. We tend toward the danger at the center soft core teeming blue with fire. We tend toward what will singe and flare, but coil back when brought near. Sometimes we read about people pushed there and left to recover. They don't, come out mangled or not at all, minds flayed by visions no one can fathom. I have a cousin who haunts the basement of my aunt's house, drinking her liquor. The air around him is cold, 
and he swings at it, working himself into a sweat like a boxer or an addict. Sometimes he comes upstairs to eat her food, feeding the thing inside him. We laugh, thinking laughter will make us safe. Then we go home and lie down in our lives. Sometimes, when my thoughts won't sit still, I imagine Marcus down there, awake in the dark, hands fisted in his lap, or upturned, open, in what might be a kind of prayer. I'm certain the same thing dragging his heart drags ours, only he's not afraid to name it can call it up into the room and swear at it, or let it rest there on the couch beside him till his head slumps onto his chest and the TV bruises the walls with unearthly light. In some ways, although I didn't realize it at, when I was writing these poems, uh, Life on Mars is a book that's seeking to answer that question from my first book, What Do You Believe In? And there are so many different um, directions that um, the poems go in an effort to bring um, something coherent and um, consoling together for me. Um, this is a poem called The Weather in Space. Is God being or pure force, the wind or what commands it? When our lives slow and we can hold all that we love, it sprawls in our laps like a gangly doll. When the storm kicks up and nothing is ours, we go chasing after all we're certain to lose so alive, faces radiant with panic. Cathedral Kitch. Does God love gold? Does he shine back at himself from walls like these, leafed in the earth's softest wealth? Women light candles pray into their fistful of beads. Cameras spit human light into the vast holy dark, and what glistens back is high up and cold. I feel man here, the same wish that named the planets. Man, with his shoes and tools, his insistence to prove we exist just like God in the large, and the small, the great and the frayed, and the chords that rise from the tall brass pipes, and the chorus of crushed cans someone drags over cobbles in the secular street. Um, there is a little bit of a sort of science fiction um, or wishful understanding of the actual principles of science um, that runs through this book. Um, so I'll just read you a little sample of that. Um, you might remember from, um, well, if anyone ever read the novelization of Kubrick's wonderful film, 2001, A Space Odyssey, um, it opens with the line, or Dot, 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 my God, it's full of stars. There's something that I'm not remembering that precedes that statement. Um, and then if any of you, like me, ever saw the movie 2010, that, that film opens with that, that quote. Um, but uh, so that sense of the future that I grew up on in science fiction from, that was made in the 60s and 70s, film mostly, um, was something that, that drove my, my visual imagination in this book, thinking about how innocent those old versions of the future always feel once we've, you know, kind of out, out, pa we've passed them up. Um, and so that's part of what's running through this poem, but of course it's also an elegy for my father. Um, so I'll read you just a few sections in which some of these things come up. My God, it's full of stars. 
Perhaps the great error is believing we are alone, that the others have come and gone, a momentary blip, when all along space might be chock full of traffic, bursting at the seams with energy we neither feel nor see, flush against us, living, dying, deciding, setting solid feet down on planets everywhere, bowing to the great stars that command, pitching stones at whatever are their moons. They live wondering if they are the only ones, knowing only the wish to know, and the great black distance they, we, flicker in. Maybe the dead know, their eyes widening at last, seeing the high beams of a million galaxies flick on at twilight, hearing the engines flare, the horns not letting up, the frenzy of being. I want it to be one notch below bedlam, like a radio without a dial, wide open so everything floods in at once and sealed tight so nothing escapes, not even time, which should curl in on itself and loop around like smoke so that I might be sitting now beside my father as he raises a lit match to the bowl of his pipe for the first time in the winter of 1959. In those last scenes of Kubrick's 2001, when Dave is whisked into the center of space, which unfurls in an aurora of orgasmic light before opening wide like a jungle orchid for a love-struck bee, then goes liquid, paint in water, and then gauze wafting out and off before finally the night tide, luminescent and vague, swirls in and on and on. In those last scenes, as he floats above Jupiter's vast canyons and seas, over the lava-strewn plains and mountains packed in ice, that whole time he doesn't blink. In his little ship, blind to what he rides, whisked across the wide screen of unparceled time, who knows what blazes through his mind? Is it still his life he moves through, or does that end at the end of what he can name? On set, it's shot after shot, till Kubrick is happy. Then the costumes go back on their racks, and the great gleaming set goes black. When my father worked on the Hubble telescope, he said they operated like surgeons scrubbed and sheathed in papery green, the room a clean cold and bright white. He'd read Larry Niven at home and drink scotch on the rocks, his eyes exhausted and pink. These were the Reagan years when we lived with our finger on the button and struggled to view our enemies as children. My father spent whole seasons bowing before the oracle eye, hungry for what it would find. His face lit up whenever anyone asked, and his arms would rise as if he were weightless, perfectly at ease in the never-ending night of space. On the ground, we tied postcards to balloons for peace. Prince Charles married Lady Di, Rock Hudson died. We learned new words for things. The decade changed. The first few pictures came back blurred, and I felt ashamed for all the cheerful engineers, my father and his tribe. The second time, the optics jibed. We saw to the edge of all there is, so brutal and alive it seemed to comprehend us back. I'll never now read this poem and not think of this place because on my last visit to the library, a wonderful librarian named Nanette 
um, and her colleagues pulled the archive of Hubble Space Telescope materials and set them up for me. And she said, I was looking at these pictures. Everybody's wearing masks. They, they're in these clean outfits. But I was hoping one of them might be your father. But don't worry. I'm going to go through his military archive and see if I can find any, anything for you. So this is, this is wonderful. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to read some newer poems. I might go backwards, um, but I, I have a new book of poems that um, will be coming out this spring, and a lot of the themes that I've always been interested in, I continue to be interested in. I think primarily they have to do with how we treat each other, whether that means intimate relationships or you know the people we never, ever meet, but uh, upon whom our lives have an effect. Um, and it's a book that's seeking to explore that question by looking backward toward history in some moments and also looking at us now as we are. And one of the things that I find myself really thinking about or maybe willfully meditating upon is this notion of compassion um, as an act or a, a mode that we can choose to operate in and often we fail to do that. Um, so I'll read you from around this book in which you'll hear different versions of that, that consideration. I think the other little thing I'd say about this book is that um, whereas Life on Mars was trying to imagine this universe, the vast thing that we know, like a tiny little pinprick-sized amount of information about with certainty, um, what I'm also interested in is what that system belongs to or what continuum it is a part of. And so I imagine that the history of eternity is something that I'm also trying to will my brain to imagine because we're a part of it, right? And what we do is imprinting that in ways that we may not even recognize. Um, so this is a, a small poem that kind of dips its toe in that question. It's called Garden of Eden. What a profound longing I feel just this very instant for the Garden of Eden on Montague Street, where I seldom shopped, usually only after therapy, elbow sore at the crook from a handbasket filled to capacity. The glossy pastries, pomegranate, persimmon, quince. Once a bag of black beluga lentils spilled a trail behind me while I labored to find a tea they refused to carry. It was Brooklyn, my 30s. Everyone I knew was living the same desolate luxury, each ashamed of the same things, innocence and privacy. I'd lug home the paper bags, doing bank balance math and counting days. I'd squint into it, or close my eyes and let it slam me in the face. The known sun setting on the dawning century. Um, uh, about five months ago, I visited coastal Georgia to Geechee and Gullah communities that make up the Sea Islands. And um, I had the privilege to attend a ring shout, which is a tradition that brings um, the spiritual into just this really beautiful, living, rhythmic um, space that reminds us of the deep connection between African-American tradition and Africa. Um, when I went to this performance, I had been, so I'd been in, in um, the South for a number of days going to a lot of sites of a very painful history, um, some of which were marked, many of which were not. And then I walked into this space feeling, you know, like a, a storm inside, just about like, you know, who uh, we are, what we, what we come from, what we are able to acknowledge and what we're not. And a woman who was one of the performers just walked up to me. I'd never seen her before in my life. And she said, I love you. And she gave me a hug. And I just lost it. I felt like that's exactly what my soul needed to hear. 
and I couldn't stop thinking about her. And so this is the poem that came from that. I've since uh, met her again, and her name is Bertha McKnight, and she's a member of the Geechee Gullah Ring Shouters, and so this poem is dedicated to them. Wade in the Water. One of the women greeted me. I love you, she said. She didn't know me, but I believed her, and a terrible new ache rolled over in my chest, like in a room where the drapes have been swept back. I love you, I love you, as she continued down the hall past other strangers, each feeling pierced suddenly by pillars of heavy light. I love you throughout the performance in every hand clap, every stomp. I love you in the rusted iron chains someone was made to drag until love let them be unclasped and left empty in the center of the ring. I love you in the water where they pretended to wade, singing that old blood deep song that dragged us to those banks and cast us in. I love you, the angles of it scraping at each throat, shouldering past the swirling dust motes in those beams of light that whatever we now knew we could let ourselves feel knew to climb. Oh, woods, oh, dogs, oh, tree, oh, gun, oh, girl, run. Oh, miraculous many gone. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, is this love the trouble you promised? So that poem leads into um, a Civil War poem that um, DC is just like such a wonderful, I'm realizing now this Civil War poem was commissioned by the Smithsonian for an exhibit, exhibit of Civil War portrait, portraits a number of years ago. So, wow, thank you. Um, it's a history that of course I've learned about but I never felt that I had a, a footing within it and so being asked to think about it was a real gift because I'm, I had to say, well, what, what perspective am I curious about? And I wanted to know about recorded um, testimonies or experiences from black soldiers of that war and their families. And um, so I found a number of sources that included letters that many um, soldiers or their widows or their families wrote to President Abraham Lincoln asking for help in some way, either getting their son paid or finding out if they were free yet. Um, and I also found a number of testimonies or from depositions that veterans and their families gave after the war, sometimes for you know decades and decades after the war, in an attempt to claim pension. Um, slavery made it very difficult for blacks to do that because there were not birth certificates or marriage certificates that people had, and so it was very difficult for them to prove that they had served. Um, so reading these, these documents, I felt like all I wanted to do was make a space for them to exist together as a chorus. And so I'm gonna read you two sections from a found poem called, I will tell you the truth about this, I will tell you all about it. And these two sections are written really as choruses that every few lines is a different speaker, but I feel like they're telling pieces of the same story. Excellent sir. My son went in the 54th Regiment. Sir, my husband, who is in Company K, 22nd Regiment, U.S. Colored Troops, and now in the Macon Hospital at Portsmouth with a wound in his arm, has not received any pay since last May, and then only $13. Sir, we, the members of Company D of the 55th Massachusetts Volunteers, call the attention of your excellency to our case. For instant, look and see that we never was freed yet, run right out of slavery into soldiery, 
and we hadn't nothing at all, and our wives and mother, most all of them is a perishing all about, and we all are perishing ourselves. I am willing to be a soldier and serve my time faithful like a man, but I think it is hard to be put off in such doggish manner as that. Will you see that the colored men fighting now are fairly treated? You ought to do this and do it at once, not let the thing run along, meet it quickly and manfully. We poor oppressed ones appeal to you and ask fair play. So please, if you can do any good for us, do it in the name of God. Excuse my boldness, but please, your reply will settle the matter and will be appreciated by a colored man who is willing to sacrifice his son in the cause of freedom and humanity. I have nothing more to say, hoping that you will lend a listening ear to an humble soldier. I will close yours for Christ's sake. I shall have to send this without a stamp for I hain't money enough to buy a stamp. Wait, there's more. <laughs> I am 60 odd years of age. I am 62 years of age next month. I am about 65 years of age. I reckon I am about 67 years old. I am about 68 years of age. I am on the rise of 80 years of age. I am 89 years old. I am 94 years of age. I don't know my exact age. I am the claimant in this case. I have testified before you two different times before. I filed my claim, I think, first about 12 years ago. I am now an applicant for a pension because I understand that all soldiers are entitled to a pension. I claim pension under the general law on account of disease of eyes as a result of smallpox contracted in service. The varicose veins came on both my legs soon after the war, and the sores were there when I first put in my claim. I claim pension for rheumatism and got my toe broke, and I was struck in the side with the breech of a gun, breaking my ribs. I was a man stout and healthy, over 27 years of age when I enlisted. When I enlisted, I had a little mustache and some chin whiskers. I was a green boy right off the farm and did just what I was told to do. When I went to enlist, the recruiting officer said to me, your name is John Wilson. I said, no, my name is Robert Harrison, but he put me down as John Wilson. I was known while in service by that name. I cannot read nor write, and I do not know how my name was spelled when I enlisted, nor do I know how it is spelled now. I always signed my name while in the army by making my mark. I know my name by sound. My mother said after my discharge that the reason the officer put my name down as John Wilson was he could draw my bounty. I am the son of Solomon and Lucinda Sibley. I am the only living child of Dennis Campbell. My father was George Jordan and my mother was Millie Jordan. My mother told me that John Barnett was my father. My mother was Mary Eliza Jackson and my father, Reuben Jackson. My name on the roll was Frank Nunn. No, sir, it was not Frank Nern. My full name is Dick Lewis Barnett. I am the applicant for pension on account of having served under the name Lewis Smith, which was the name I wore before the days of slavery were over. My correct name is Hiram Kirkland. Some persons call me Harry, and others call me Henry, but neither is my correct name. The United States welcomes you. Why and by whose power were you sent? 
What do you see that you may wish to steal? Why this dancing? Why do your dark bodies drink up all the light? What are you demanding that we feel? Have you stolen something? Then what is that leaping in your chest? What is the nature of your mission? Do you seek to offer a confession? Have you anything to do with others brought by us to harm? Then why are you afraid? And why do you invade our night, hands raised, eyes wide, mute as ghosts? Is there something you wish to confess? Is this some enigmatic type of test? What if we fail? How and to whom do we address our appeal? I think I will um, kind of wind down with just a couple of poems. Um, I want to read something that's a little bit happy. <laughs> okay, uh, this is a poem. Um, my daughter is here being so perfect and wonderful in the front row. So this is a poem that was written a few years back. It's called Four and a Half. Morning finds her curled like a prawn around a stuffed blue pegasus or the smallest prawn pink lion. Or else she's barging into my room and leaning in close, so it's her hair I wake to, that coarse dark heaven of knots and purple fluff. And she's hungry, but first she has to pee. Pee, pee, she sings, hopping in place trying to staunch off the wild, ravenous river she carries until I'm awake for real, saying, go, go, hurry before you wet the floor. And then she tries and succeeds, or else stands bereft, relieved, as a pool trickles out around her feet. <laughs> She's like an island made of rock with one lone tree at the top of the only mountain. She's like the sole incongruous goat tethered to the tree, smiling almost as you approach, scraping the ground with its horns and then lickety split, lurching hard, daring the rope to snap. She's hungry. She wants bread toasted with no skin and enough butter to write her name in. <laughs> or a bowl of cereal, but not the noisy kind. She wants a movie, or maybe just the tussle of her will against mine, that scrape and crack, horn on rock, rope relenting one fiber at a time. I want that, she says, punctuating what she just said she wanted. Um, before I close with one last poem, I want to reiterate my thanks to everyone here tonight, many of whom are family members, teachers, friends, mentors, um, colleagues in this world of poetry, and of course to Dr. Hayden and Rob Casper and the, the library staff who've just been so wonderful in making this feel like it's not just a dream, this is real, this is really happening. Um, so thank you, and of course Amanda, I'm excited to follow your voice. Um, an old story. We were made to understand it would be terrible. Every small want, every niggling urge, every hate swollen to a kind of epic wind. Livid the land and ravaged like a rageful dream. The worst in us having taken over and broken the rest utterly down. A long age passed, when at last we knew how little would survive us, how little we had mended or built that was not now lost. Something large and old awoke. 
and then our singing brought on a different manner of weather. Then animals long believed gone crept down from trees. We took new stock of one another. We wept to be reminded of such color. Thank you. have to sit for long. I'll be quick, I promise. Uh, I'm Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here at the Library of Congress. Uh, and I'm delighted to let you know that um, because this is the start of our literary season, our biggest event other than the uh, concluding Poet Laureate event, uh, we have a wonderful reception upstairs. Uh, this year it is in LJ119, which is just one floor up and uh, over in the corner. Uh, Tracy will be signing books. You can buy them in the hallway there. There is another reception going on uh, just down the way in the Great Hall in the second floor. Uh, so you should probably stick in our end and not go there. Um, <laughs> but why would you want to go there anyway uh, when you can hang out with the U.S. Poet Laureate and the National Youth Poet Laureate? So join me again in thanking Tracy and Amanda. Amanda.